a mental health crisis and a police response. Two perspectives on the moments before a 19-year-old's death. COVID-19 booster shots could be going into arms next month. Critics say there's more than one reason to hit the pause button on that. I'm not feeling good, but my country is situation is right now it's pretty bad. Colorado is going to take in Afghan refugees. We have for years. Tonight, very specific way that we can each help new neighbors starting their lives over here. Police say they were responding to a disturbance at a home in Loveland on Monday night, and then they shot a man who lived there who was armed with a knife. Civil rights attorney working with his family says the family called 911 asking for help. They were not expecting lethal force. She told 9 News reporter Jennifer Meckles there's a lot more to this story. What police have shared about a shooting in Loveland Monday night is summarized in three short paragraphs written by the critical incident response team, which is investigating why Loveland police shot a man in his own backyard. Dispatchers received a 911 call regarding a quote disturbance on Tennessee Street just before 7 p.m. When officers arrived, they found a man armed with a knife. And during the course of this interaction, the police officer fired several shots, striking the man. What happened during that interaction and why it ended with gunshots, police have not said. The man shot was 19-year-old Alex Domina, according to his family's attorney. He uh, was suffering from a mental health crisis when his grandmother called 911 to get the kind of help he needed. Mari Newman says Alex lived with his grandmother. And she said he has severe mental disabilities after years of abuse as a child. Grandma called 911 because he was he was breaking things. And so she was concerned that he was having a mental health crisis. And she made it clear to the dispatcher not only that he could be talked down, but he hadn't hurt anybody. Newman says Alex did not threaten his family with a knife. She says he grabbed one from the kitchen because he was scared of police. No family should ever have the fear that when they call 911 for help, what's going to end up happening is that their loved one is going to be shot three times. Alex survived the shooting. According to his family's attorney, he's had three surgeries since and is still not breathing on his own. We have reached out to Loveland Police and Fort Collins Police, which is leading the shooting investigation, just asking if these officers understood this to be a mental health crisis, if that affected how they approached this man and what exactly led them to firing shots. Police has not, have not shared any of that information at this point. An independent consultant is already looking into Loveland Police's current practices and policies and procedures following the forcible arrest of somebody else, a 73-year-old woman with dementia that happened last year. Kyle. And, and we know, Jane, this is a situation that plays out in so many cities where families or neighbors want help but don't necessarily want an armed response. And then the question is what tools are at the disposal of whoever gets called. Exactly. And that is why this family is saying that information was shared, but we have not heard the police's response to those claims. All right. Jennifer Meckles reporting. Thank you. Police tried to stop a homicide suspect today. It ended with the deadly shooting on a golf course in Thornton. Oh, jeez. Oh. They shot him? Yeah, he was. He shot first. Golfers at Thorn Creek Golf Course captured what happened after officers opened fire. North Glen police first contacted a man in the 300 block of Malley. Police say he sped away and then stopped at 136th Avenue near the golf course. They say he ran onto the course and pulled out a gun. Police say there was an exchange of gunfire and the man was killed. No officers were hurt. Police have not identified the man. A former roommate of the ex Aurora police officer charged with pistol whipping a man says the guy he lived with never should have become a police officer. Nine News crime justice reporter Matt Jablo spoke with the Hubbard's former roommate who says that he personally witnessed his temper. Jesus. Brian Andricott could hardly believe what he was seeing. It's tough. The body camera video of Aurora police officer John Harbert pistol whipping, choking, and threatening to shoot an unarmed man accused of trespassing. Stop fighting! I don't Stop fighting! After prosecutors charged Harbert with assault last month, he resigned from the force. But Brian says Harbert should never have been a cop in the first place. You have a gun pointed straight no, at your head. That is what gets me, the, the gun. In the spring of 2009, Brian lived in this Arvada house with Harbert and two other young men. On the night of March 6th, 
They were all planning to go out together, but Brian says Harbert came home late and drunk. He ended up just showing up at the house and parking on the front lawn, so a little inebriated. Causing a heated argument between Harbert and one of the other housemates. And so these two got into a pretty escalated verbal argument pretty quickly. Brian says after the argument, Harbert went to his room and was in there for a while. So he went to make sure he was okay. Go down there, slowly open the door, John, how are you doing? To find him kind of just in the corner, hunker down, like and pointing a gun right at me, saying, if you take another step forward, you're gonna meet the other end of this. So, uh, you know, I slowly backed away, shut the door. Court records show that Harbert was initially charged with felony menacing, but ultimately pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor charge of prohibited use of a weapon drunk with a gun. Did you ever talk to him again after that incident? No. Brian says Harbert moved out the day after the incident, and he hadn't heard anything about him since, 12 years until two weeks ago when he saw the video of Harbert pistol whipping the trespassing suspect in Aurora. I was surprised that he became a cop. I don't think he ever should have. According to Brian, he was never contacted by anyone with the city of Aurora before Harbert was hired as a cop in 2018. It never should have happened. It never should have happened. He says if anyone had reached out, he would have told them not just about the troubling 2009 incident, but about other signs of emotional distress that Harbert had displayed. It's, it's obvious when you see that thousand yard stare from somebody. According to the U.S. military, Harbert served in the Marines for five years. He fought in the war in Iraq in 2003 and 2004 and was awarded the Combat Action Ribbon. But yeah, he had some, some pictures of uh, his accomplishments across seas. Brian says Harbert never talked about his time as a Marine, but he once saw a photo album of Harbert's with pictures of people that Harbert had presumably killed while fighting in Iraq. Real quick, I, I saw him. I, other housemates kind of perused a little longer, but yeah, they were trophies of deaths that he had wrecked up. Pictures of people. He yeah, that he killed. What makes you sure? I mean, you could see John. The Aurora Civil Service Commission, which screens and hires all entry-level police officers, says even though they were aware of Harbert's 2009 criminal case before he was hired, they don't think that anyone from the city contacted any of Harbert's roommates to get more details about the incident or about Harbert. In a statement to Nine News, a spokesman said the city shares in the concerns that you are reporting and that all hiring processes always have room for improvement. Does it surprise you that you weren't contacted? Yes. Brian says in Harbert's case, the hiring process was a flat out failure. And he's telling his story in hopes that the process is soon changed and that police officer candidates are much more closely scrutinized. I mean, if they're not even doing the basic checks as far as to, you know, um, somebody's behavior before becoming an officer, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, what are we doing? In Aurora, Matt Jablo, 9 News. We tried contacting Hobart's attorney. But he's not returned our calls. Hobart's facing charges for assault and was in court today. His preliminary hearing is set for October 6th. The first evacuees from Afghanistan landed in the U.S. today, including American civilians and contractors. The Pentagon says 5,000 people have left so far, but military leaders warned the military does not have the capacity to retrieve all Americans who cannot reach the U.S. secured airfield in Kabul. President Biden said if needed, U.S. forces could stay in Afghanistan past the August 31st deadline to get every American out of the country. The Pentagon said it's working with the Taliban to safely evacuate evacuate people. The U.S. is also helping Afghans with exit visas, but many are complaining the process is too slow. Today, Governor Polis sent a letter to the president saying that Colorado will help Afghan refugees. He also pushed the Biden administration to rescue Afghans who helped American forces. When those refugees arrive, three resettlement agencies in Denver will be ready. Here's 9 News reporter Luis De Leon. Besides the furniture, <laughs> it's Badi Alai Rahimi's kids that make his Aurora apartment feel like home. Everything is good. Everything is so far good. I, I, we, I don't have any complaint. Rahimi was born and raised in Afghanistan, just north of Kabul, and came to the U.S. in 2018 in search of a better life. When I came here, we had one kid. And when he came here, the African Community Center of Denver helped him get a place to live within days of getting to the U.S. But he knows how much harder it is on those still in Afghanistan right now. I'm not feeling good. 
but my country's situation is right now, it's very bad. Families fleeing from Taliban rule to the U.S. is why Denver's three resettlement agencies We've been ramping up volunteers are getting ready to help those who need it. We are increasing um, capacity, whether that be working with community partners and volunteers. The International Rescue Committee, Lutheran um, Family really Center, and African Community Center are not sure yet how many people that they'll help. The African Community Center shared that they've taken in 40 people as of Wednesday in the last two months and are expecting to help at least 40 more. Everything from securing housing for individuals, going to the airport and picking families up, um, to case management, employment services, psychosocial support. A lot of our capacity comes from is when community members step up and, and help out. Helping out families yeah. like Rahimi's who have a message. International community to help Afghan people, they are faced to money problem in our country. Now the goal for these agencies, of course, is getting these families into apartments or really permanent housing right away. But recently, and understandably, of course, they haven't been getting much notice, sometimes just 24 hours, which Kim Kyle, understandably, again, that is not much time to land an apartment right away. So that calls for a plan B, which obviously calls for temporary housing. So an example of that is the International mm -hmm. Rescue Committee they partner with companies like Airbnb, for example, uh, to, to, to house those families while they wait. Yeah, and then there's just so many other people that need to be involved to help them adjust, assimilate, everything else. Absolutely, a lot of resources that they're trying to get them in touch with right now. So. Okay, all right, thank you, Luis. So speaking of, next Word of Thanks microgiving campaign this week is supporting the African Community Center's work with those incoming Afghan refugees. they got a 20-year history in our community of helping refugees build successful and self-sufficient lives in Colorado, helping to get them housing, as Luis mentioned, jobs, into the right schools, make community connections. Since 6 o'clock tonight, next viewers have raised almost $63,000 to support their work with the Afghan families coming into our community. If you text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, we'll send you that link to join us in giving. Just something small that we can do together to welcome those families that helped American troops in Afghanistan and now need a safe place to call home.